It's good to see all of you here. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? You get enough to eat? Too much to eat? You're able to fit in your clothes this morning? Good, good. It was a little touch and go for my belt, so but I uh, had a lot of good food this week. But I'm glad to, to be here this morning. Uh, we're continuing on in our series, our year-long series, focused on the Bible, but our our new series focused on the short letters that we find in the New Testament, little letters. Uh, last week we looked at the letter of, anyone remember? Oh, man. All right. Philemon. Philemon. All right. It's all right. Uh, but today we're going to move on to the book of Jude. How many of you have read the Jude recently? In the past uh, year? Anyone? All right. I see a few hands going up. It's a short book, right? These are all little letters. These are the shortest books in the New Testament. And Jude is a little odd. There's several kind of weird, bizarre passages in it. And we're not going to dig into those because we could actually spend several sermons looking at some of these interesting uh, verses in Jude. Uh, we did reflect on, on one of them earlier this year when we looked at the, the st- our Stranger Text series, uh, talking about how angels are, there's this abyss. Um, but we're not going to look at that in this morning's uh, sermon. We're going to look so, at some more of the some more practical things that kind of affect your life and my life. And we're going to find that one of the, the key truths of this book is that we know spiritual truth by staying close to God. But to help give us a, a good overview, a good understanding, a pretty thorough understanding, actually, of the entire book of Jude, we're going to take a look at a video from our friends at the Bible Project. The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. First of all, they've distorted God's grace as a license to sin. They think that they're forgiven and they have God's spirit, so now they can do whatever they want, especially when it comes to money and sex. And so Judah says they betray Jesus by rejecting his authority and his teachings. And Judah wants this church to know that the appearance of these teachers is no surprise. He transitions into a longer warning to stay away from them. He first offers two sets of three Old Testament examples. The first trio is about rebellious people who in the past received divine justice. So the Israelites who rebelled against God in the wilderness, they got what they wanted and they died out in the middle of nowhere. Then he brings up a story about angels who are imprisoned for rebellion until they face God's justice. He's referring to the interpretation of the story in Genesis 6 offered in the popular Jewish work called First Enoch, where the sons of God are interpreted to refer to angels who rebelled against God, then had sex with women and were judged accordingly. Judah links this story to his third example about the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, where violent men tried to have sex with angels. Both these stories are about rebellion against God's order that led to sexual immorality, and that's precisely what the corrupt teachers are guilty of. 
After this, Judah brings up a bonus example from a popular Jewish text called the Testament of Moses. Like Enoch, it was not part of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was a creative retelling of Moses' final days and words based on Deuteronomy. In the section that Judah quotes from, Moses has died, and there's a good angel, Michael, who is refuting the devil's accusations against Moses, but he decides to leave final judgment for God alone. Now, these stories might seem kind of odd to you, but for Jewish people who were raised on this literature, Judah's warnings make good sense. The behavior of these corrupt teachers has ancient roots, rebellion against God's authority, sexual immorality, rejecting God's messengers. And this connects to the second trio of examples. They're all about rebels who went on to corrupt other people. So Cain, he murdered his brother, but then he went on to build a city where violence reigned. Balaam, the sorcerer, he couldn't curse Israel, and so he lured them into idolatry and sexual corruption. And then Korah, the Levite, he led a rebellion against Moses that ended in disaster for others. Judah concludes the second trio with a barrage of Old Testament images to describe the teachers. They're like the selfish shepherds of Ezekiel, or like the clouds with no rain from Proverbs, or like the chaotic waves from Isaiah. Their self-absorption betrays their claim to follow Jesus. They create chaos wherever they go. Judah concludes his warning by quoting from two other warnings, one ancient and one recent. The first comes, again, from the popular book of First Enoch, which claimed to contain the visions of the ancient figure Enoch from the book of Genesis. Now, what's fascinating is Judah quotes from the opening chapter of Enoch, which is itself quoting about half a dozen Old Testament texts about the final day of the Lord's justice on human evil. Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning with a more recent one from the apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith, and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer, by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace. The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like First Enoch or the Testament of Moses. It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scriptures. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later books should be viewed as scripture, but regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, knowing his readers that they would value words from First Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. That's a lot to get out of uh, 20 some verses, right? 
is very insightful, isn't it? To, to see all of the components at play. You know, and we spent time earlier this year in our, our focus on Scripture talking about the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Again, one of my favorite words to say, <laughs> Pseudepigrapha. Um, but again, we're not going to take a, a look at that this morning. Uh, but we're going to launch in here, uh, picking up in verse 3. It says, Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. So these people have come, they've wormed their way into your church with fake news. They've come saying that it's okay, that you can do whatever you want, you can live however you want because of God's grace. And Judah is saying, no, that, that's, that's wrong, that's, 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 gonna, that's dangerous, that is not true at all. We live in a world today, in 2019, where it's becoming increasingly difficult to know what is truth. It's become increasingly easy for people to worm their way into our lives, into our minds, into our ears, into our eyes with fake news. We read a report one day that says coconut oil is good for our health. And we read the very next day another report saying that it's bad for our health. What are we to believe? If you've been following these impeachment hearings for the president, we have one news outlet take the testimony of so-and-so and say, this proves the president's innocence. And then we have other news outlets taking that same exact testimony and saying, oh, this proves the president's guilt. What are we to believe? It seems that truth is becoming more and more um, based on our own perceptions that the absolute nature of truth is shifting like grains of sand. And with this increasingly uh, unstable concept of truth, it's become easy for us to pick and choose what truth we like. Oh, I like coconut oil, so I'm going to believe that the study that says that it's good for me is true. Oh, I don't like the president, so I'm going to believe that these reports saying that he's guilty are true. It's easy to, to pick and choose now what relative truth we want to believe. But there are truths that aren't relative. There are still absolute truths that demand us to conform our lives around these facts. This year is 2019. It's not 1842. Right? We live in, or we're here today, in Tracy, California, not Tokyo, Japan. There are absolute truths that make a difference in how we live life. It would be absurd for us to go around living like it was 1842, right? It would be totally bizarre for us to insist that we're actually in Tokyo, Japan. If we did that, people would think we were crazy, right? If we lived life disconnected from absolute truth, we would probably be sent to a, a mental health facility. And the same holds true for spiritual truths. There are absolute spiritual truths that necessitate us to conform our lives around them. And this is what Jude is saying, that these false teachers have come in and warped your sense of truth, have tried to replace these absolute truths for relative truths, have tried to exchange what you know, what was foundational bedrock truth, and give you something else that is damaging, that is dangerous. These people, he says, who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives. They defy authority and scoff at supernatural beings. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. 
Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. He says these people have divorced themselves, have separated themselves from these absolute spiritual truths, and they are being destroyed because of it, because it's not good. It is not beneficial to separate yourself from absolute truth. No matter how much you might want it, want to, no matter how stubborn you might be, you can plug your ears and, and you can insist all that you want that it is summer. But that doesn't make it so. Going outside right now in shorts and a tank top, you're going to be in trouble, right? With the cold, rainy weather. You know, I- I- insisting that, that, that this is, you know, uh, that it's actually 6 o'clock p.m. when it's actually not even noon, it's going to throw everyone else off. It's going to throw your life off. You're going to be constantly late and you're never going to make appointments because the whole, your whole concept of time has been warped because things are problematic when you try to separate yourself when you do not live life according to absolute truth. And these problems are, are magnified depending on the, the level of, of facts that you are denying depending on the, the, the intensity of the situation. For example, a chef could insist that salt is the same as sugar, but that would result in people finding his food disgusting, right? It's a, it's a kind of a, a low-level uh, divorce from reality. But a pharmacist, if he were to insist that blood sugar medicine is the same as blood pressure medicine, that's going to end up with people dying. So the gravity of the situation is dependent upon the level of facts that are being twisted or not adhered to. And, and, and Jude is saying that this is a serious situation. That these people that have wormed their way in, they're not just trying to get you to... to think that their car is a different color than it is. They're trying to get you to think that the fundamental nature of the gospel is different than what it is. And this has dangerous results. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. This is serious, Judah's saying. So they are like wolves in sheep's clothing. They are here to destroy your lives. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times, there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. You might think they do because they have the the appearance of a sheep, but they are actually wolves. They, they are false teachers that, that are presenting false data. They are presenting false things about who God is, about who we are as people. They're, they're saying false things about what sin is and about what Christ has done for us. And these false teachers, what happens is they begin with a co- wrong concept of God. And this is very important when it comes to understanding spiritual false teachings, is that it, it begins with a wrong idea of who God is. See, people often like to change or manipulate God in order to, to suit our purposes. Sometimes people like to ignore God's his judgment and, and his justice. And so it presents a God who is soft and weak. 
Other people like to ignore God's love and grace and mercy, and it presents God as, as a harsh and cruel judge. Other times, people ignore God's personality, and it strips him down to being a mathematical God, an impersonal God that just kind of put the numbers in and has let the system run. But every time we try to strip away a aspect, a character of who God is, we're left with a diminished, weakened version of God. And that leads to a lot of bad things. When you begin with the wrong concept of God, the foundation is destroyed. And second, a wrong concept of God leads to a wrong concept of ourselves. If you don't understand the artist, you're not going to understand the art, right? If you think that the artist is some dark, depressed, emo, goth person, you're going to read that into their artwork. If you think of the, the artist as, as a happy-go-lucky, all evanescent, excitable person, you're going to read that into his or her art. The same thing goes with the creator, a wrong concept of the creator leads to a wrong understanding of the creation. And so if you have a wrong concept of God, we're going to have a wrong concept of who we are. We need to understand who God is, and we need to understand what he says about who we are. We need to understand and believe that when God says we're sinners, we're sinners. But we need to understand and believe that when God says that we are loved, that we are loved and forgiven and have the opportunity at everlasting life. These are things that we need to understand when we properly understand who God is. We can put ourselves in their proper context as his children, as his created beings. See, we know spiritual truth by staying close to God. When people come in and start trying to tell us things that are wrong about who God is, when they come in with a, a wrong concept of who God is and, and start to tell us wrong things about ourselves, we can know what is right and wrong if we have that connection, that close relationship with God. If we don't, then we might think, oh, that, that is a good idea. Oh, that sounds right. Let me, let, let me live my life that way. And before we know it, we've gone off one way or the other. Jude continues in verse 20. He says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Jude comes to the end of this letter talking about false teachers by giving some very practical steps that we can do in 2019 in order to, to combat false teachings. So how do we fight false teachers according to this closing passage in Jude? Well, the first is to build ourselves up in holy faith. What Jude means by this is, is, is having our personal connection with God, specifically by reading the Bible for ourselves. It's not outsourcing our spirituality. It's not simply listening to this preacher or that TV show to tell us what we need to know about God. But we build ourselves up in holy faith by spending time for ourselves in the Bible. This is why we've been spending an entire year focused on the Bible so that we can understand and have better tools and, 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 under, and, and a better grasp on, on the different components of the Bible, on the writers of the Bible, and the themes of the Bible so that, so that it will help you personally as you study the Bible. This is why we have things like Morning Blend, like we had this morning, where we have personal uh, to, uh, devotional tools that will aid in, in your ability to, to read Scripture and to connect with God. Because it's not enough for us to, to spend time watching 
3 ABN or the Hope Channel or, or this religious broadcast or that one to, to listen to or watch Doug Batchelor or Joel Osteen or, or even just to rely on your pastor like me. It's important for you to spend time yourself. We're here to help. We're here to give you some tools. But if this is all the, the, the time you're spending in the Word is, is a few minutes on a Sabbath morning, these false teachers are going to come in. And it's going to be, oh, no big deal. We need to have that connection with Scripture ourselves in order to know, to, in order to build up that holy faith ourselves in our own lives. The second thing that Jude says is to pray in the Spirit. And how do you pray in the Spirit? There's different people have different ideas on this, but the, the main thing is to be able to connect to the Spirit by by having an environment in your life, in your heart, that makes the Spirit welcome. You can't live, you can't make choices 99% of the time, 99.5% of the time, that are self-serving or are not spiritual and expect the Holy Spirit to be comfortable in your life, in your heart. You might fill your lives, you might fill your hearts with, with good things, with work and family and, and all these types of things. And, and, that's not, and that's not bad. But if you're not creating an environment, if you're not consciously making choices in your life that makes the Spirit welcome, it's going to be very difficult to maintain that connection. It's going to be very difficult to, to pray in the Spirit. And some theologians have said, praying in the Spirit for five minutes is more powerful has a better effect than an entire year of hit and miss prayers that we do on our own power. This is what Judas is saying. Maintain that connection. Build up yourselves in holy faith by reading the scripture and pray in the spirit. Have your lives open and, and, and inviting to the spirit to, to maintain that, that vital conversational connection with God. Third, he says, wait patiently for Christ's mercy. Uh, this is kind of a double effect. He's talking about wait patiently for Christ to return, but also wait patiently for Christ's mercy to, to shape your character. That, that process of sanctification to become more and more like Christ. Fourth, he says, keep ourselves in the love of God. How do you keep yourself in God's love? The, the video said, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, obey my commandments. But he also says, if you love God, you know, there's two rules. He says, you can boil everything down to, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. So how do you keep yourself in the, in the love of God is to, to love your neighbors because this is what God is commanding us to is how you live in a right relationship, in a loving relationship with your neighbors. To, to be loving towards them, to be compassionate towards them, to be caring towards them. This doesn't mean that you celebrate false teachers and their false teachings. You don't celebrate and just throw your hands up and, and everything is fine. But he's saying you keep yourselves in the love of God by being compassionate, by being caring and loving towards others. And fifth, he says, rescue others. You fight false teachers by rescuing others, by helping others. I've heard um, several professional teachers say that one of the best ways for for their students to really grasp a concept is to have them teach it or tutor one of their classmates with it. And I found that to be true in my own life. I might understand something, but, but to be able to verbally express it, to be able to tell someone else about it, to, to teach someone else about it, it helps me to understand it better. It helps me to, to make some of those philosophical or theoretical things more concrete. And so he says, go and, and share the truth with others. And as you share the truth, it's gonna, you're going to learn it better. You're going to understand it more. And so as you're sharing it with others, if false teachers come along, you're going to say, no, I understand that what you're saying is wrong because I've been spending time teaching others about it. This is what Jude is saying. You fight these false teachers by building ourselves up in the holy faith, by praying in the Spirit, by patiently waiting for Christ's mercy, by keeping ourselves in the love of God, and by rescuing others. Ultimately, what Jude is, Jude's point is, is that we know spiritual truth by staying close to God. 
And he closes with this benediction. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Amen. This morning, may you know absolute truth. May we all know absolute spiritual truth. This morning, may we all be able to resist false teachers by walking closely with God. And may we all glorify God in our lives.